no matter how many advanced civilizations you find in Africa, you still find tribal people who were living and are living in hunter-gatherer scenarios, from Bantus to Khoisan, and even in the olden days in the West Nigerian regions and Nilotics, Ethiopians, and even Egyptians and North Africans. How is this possible that these people were living like this in this survival mode when we know there were so many empires that stretched the entire vastness of the continents? What respect did the people who were already advanced have for the natives to allow them to continue to live in such a fashion? If we look at the sand population of southern Africa, the so-called sand populations, which are multiple traditional groups, we find them scattered all over the southern African regions, and even though their domain shrank because of the Bantu expansion, we still find millions during the times of the Bantus until, of course, the Europeans came and started blasting a lot of them. Linguistics is only one way of tracing this history. As you can tell, the Twa people, who spoke a completely unique language of what people call the Pygmies, but the group, the language group they call the Twa, and the Khoisan spoke a completely unique language from one another. This is how we know they had been separated for an extremely long time. But we know that the Twa lived in the southern African regions for the most part. We know some of them must have lived in the Ethiopian regions and even in the Congolese regions, but mainly in the southern African regions because that's where we find most of their art and what's more typical of their art. The Khoisan people we find from Congo all the way down to South Africa at the tip. In fact, we find them there thousands and thousands of years ago, tens of thousands of years ago, and their art seems to be consistent over this long span of time in terms of the art style. Now, this art style is a giveaway. It's almost like if you were comparing Salvador Dali to Leonardo da Vinci, you can tell almost immediately whose work is whose simply by looking at the styles. And not only this, but they picked completely different subject matter. Things that mattered to one group did not matter to the other. The Twa tended to opt for symbols and geographical shapes, almost typical of the people who lived slightly north of the Khoisan while the Khoisan depicted nature and themselves even in religious positions where their bodies are fully stretched. These people were not aware of how short they were. If you look at their images, you could tell that in their head they're really, really tall. But in real life, these people are some of the shortest people in Africa compared to the rest of the African populations because, of course, of some theories that biologists have that if you live in colder areas you become shorter just like how you find a lot of people who live in cold areas are shorter but there are a lot of exceptions to that and that a lot of people who live in hotter areas equatorial areas they're very very tall and we do see this in Africa now a lot of people judge these stone paintings or these rock paintings as harshly as they possibly can but something they don't think about that I have put together long time ago is that think back think back to some of the most sophisticated civilizations in history if we take the five arts we take music dance visual art storytelling and body adornment there's still only one art that speaks to us from its history there's still only one art that comes to us at a very deep level that tells us almost everything about what that we need to know about these populations, and that's visual art. If you notice, the Khoisan people, they went 
to very deep levels to show us what they did. I mean, in this image, there's someone riding an animal, a horse as it appears, or some kind of horse-like animal. And this is unique in this region because, of course, the Khoisan people are thought to have never ridden any animal except the Khoi riding cattle, which we assume they got in the last 3,000 years of our history. But these things, these clues will help us figure out what time they're from. So if you see any depiction of men with giant spears and giant shields. Now you're talking about the Bantus. If you see people running around with bow and arrows with red ochre, you're talking about Khoisan people. If you see people who are with giant heads and they're depicted wearing very elaborate clothing, it's probably Chadic people. If you see very dark-skinned people being depicted with very lengthy bodies, it's usually the Nilotic people in these southern African regions. So that's how we can tell. Now, of course, there's one more art via storytelling that is very, 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 very helpful in history, and that's writing. Unfortunately, the Khoisan and the Twa people didn't have writing, so we don't really know exactly what happened. What we can tell, though, is that these people weren't prone to war. For the most part, they didn't even have shields, which is one of the biggest things that you will invent immediately when you need to fight a human being. Because obviously, when you're fighting a human being, that person has got more of a mind advantage and so you need to block that person as quickly as you can in order to continue to take the offensive. Whereas if you're going after animals, all that you need is a bow and arrow and tactics, which these guys had in spades. The Twa and the Khoisan are basically a bow and arrow population, and you can see that all over their art. Not only can we tell from the change in style that there were different people, but there'd also be change in depiction of people, because people would depict different people in different ways. For example, the Khoisan usually depicted themselves with red ochre, depicted the Bantus with darker brown colors, and then they depicted white people with white. As you can see with some of the depictions of Westerners, they are almost easy to tell that you're looking at westerners because they depict the clothes and everything these slightly modern paintings in these cave paintings show you what the Khoisan saw when they looked at the Europeans if you were if we had no clue what Europeans look like outside of these images we would be very confused a little bit about what is being painted here but you can see that that is a horse and a European on it who looks like a farmer of some kind and then of course there are the females and all this other stuff these paintings are absolutely wonderful of course they are even boats and stuff and these depictions though more recent would have started a long time ago when the Khoisan first ran into the Europeans with Vasco da Gama and all these other people, Bartholomew Dias, seeing great ships just come out of nowhere and think to themselves, like, we're going to have to contend with this from now on. Now, I do not want to make the mistake that Vasco da Gama made by thinking that these people were unlikely to do war. He made that mistake and when he got surrounded and one of his people got shot by these Khoisan people, he found himself in a very tough position having to flee the location. Because obviously the Khoisan are still grown men and they will come after you if you come after them. 
Something very interesting, though, is that most human beings in history come at you very peaceful. Like if we take Japan, for example, when they kicked out the Portuguese, you would think that they would have the same anger towards the black-skinned slaves that they brought with them, that it's just a whole group of evils so just kick them all out but instead they free them and give them higher positions in japan almost throwing away this idea that the japanese were these super strict don't care about the bottom of the barrel only care about making sure that their highest up are doing well and even if you take oda nobunaga and yasuke even in that part you can see that the random black slave is given a high position for some reason and this is no exception because of course if you take the Africans that went to the Americas a lot of them got adopted by the Native American tribes and remember it was the Europeans and the Arabs that were more concerned with race at this time than any other group every other group in history did not really care about race if you're Iroquois, you're Iroquois, whether you're black or white. If you're Japanese, you're Japanese, whether you're black or white. If you're Bantu, you're Bantu, whether you're black or white. It doesn't matter. These groups only started circling and considering themselves racially after they realized that if we do not bond racially, we will be taken out by these people, which is why suddenly the Iroquois join with all the other Indian leagues and they call themselves the native Indian leagues and stuff like that in order to protect themselves from foreign adversaries. Another thing that helps, the fact that these people were not quote-unquote that advanced technologically, something that helps with this is that we can look deep in the past and separate what men were doing and women were doing. As you saw in the previous images, the men tend to have bow and arrows because they're hunters and they're surrounded by animals and they tend to be depicted around animals. The women, on the other hand, who are depicted as very feminine with these typical African female bodies, I mean, some of them are more because, of course, the Khoisan people had a certain physique that is not small compared to all the other women of the world. But they're seen holding gathering sticks or digging sticks because, of course, the women did the gathering while the men did the hunting. And we know this because we still have it in our time and even in the time of, you know, the last few centuries. So we can trace and show that, okay, so for thousands of years, at least in this location, Unlike what some historians had thought a long time ago, there was a separation between men and women in terms of jobs, whereas some people thought that women did nothing and then men did everything, which is not true. There's a separation between men and women in jobs in that the women do the gathering, climbing trees, digging out the ground, finding roots, carving certain things. And the men did the hunting for the most part. This means that no person, no human was wasted. They spent their resources very, very well. And considering the fact that this is way before the modern times, they would have been comfortably doing these things. And even though they were hunter-gatherers, they still took the time to depict their everyday life. Even images of females chit-chatting. By the way, these images are not rare. They're actually plentiful and they're everywhere. There's thousands of them. Even in some very small towns around Africa, you will find that if you look at certain very locked down areas now that these paintings will be found everywhere some places that people didn't actually know that people went there because of course some of their junk was not that 
plentiful in that area, even though it was there, it was easier to tell that they had been to the location because you see the paintings. And of course, again, the depictions of these people, especially in the Southern African regions, make it quite obvious that they're Khoisan in the way they're drawn, the bow and arrows, the digging sticks, the difference in job occupation because of course once you go to the bantus they start to become farmers not hunter gatherers and in the hunter gatherer stages you need specific smaller things and of course digging sticks they're using sticks and stones to go through their lands whereas when the bantus show up they're using iron copper all this other very important and very advanced technology, which would be very important when the Bantus would run into foreigners who were very, very armed, like the Europeans, like the Ethiopians, like the Arabs, like the Nilotics. Now, it didn't always result in war. In fact, I've shown you too many options, too many ideas, too many people who did not start with war. You know, they didn't shoot first and ask questions later. But when it was time to go to the war, you can bet that the Bantus were ready. And they won most of their wars they fought up until like the 1800s i mean africa was really colonized in the 1800s after hundreds of years of full knowledge by foreigners that they were there i remember one arab which i'm not gonna put it in here but talking about how there was so many zanj bantu people that the East Africans, though they knew about them, would not dare go to their location to start war as they did with the Yemenis because they would be crushed by how plentiful they are. You can see here boats that depict several things that's going on. First, you can see that they are fishing with sticks, long sticks. This is something you don't see today. Because, of course, the coasts have been captured by the colonizers of all kinds. But boats are numerous and they're used around the oceans. And, of course, there's horses in the background. These people have been doing this for thousands of years. But, of course, today when people see Khoisan and they see these random groups of Africans in their head, they believe that they're just people who lived on the land who did small things and barely had any technology or anything like that and didn't even go to the point of having boats now a lot of people don't even believe that there were boats on the way to madagascar they believe that maybe the seas ro like drained or something happened to get them to madagascar but pictures like these make it quite evident that there were boats in the southern african regions and not only this, we have evidence that's written by Vasco da Gama when he first came through in the 1500s and he noticed this on Seal Island. The inhabitants of this country are tawny colored. Their food is confined to the flesh of seals, whales and gazelles and the roots of herbs. They are dressed in skins and wear sheets over their virile members. They are armed with poles of olive wood to which a horn browned in the fire is attached. Their numerous dogs resemble those of Portugal and bark like them. The birds of the country likewise are the same as in Portugal and include cormorants, gulls, turtles, doves, crested larks, and many others. The climate is healthy and temperature and produces good herbage. On the day after we had cast anchor, that is to say, on Thursday, November 9th, we landed with the Captain Major and made captive one of the natives, who was small of stature like Sancho Mixia. 
this man had been gathering honey in the sandy waste for in this country the bees deposit their honey at the foot of the mounds he then speaks of the koi in december after this event had happened who followed him and arrived at him these koi had several things going for them for first of all they're farmers this is why they called koi san the koi part represents the people who were doing farming and then the sand part represents the hunter gatherers about 200 negroes came both young and old they brought with them about a dozen oxen and cows and four or five sheep as soon as we saw them we went ashore they forthwith began to play on four or five flutes some producing high notes and low notes thus making a pretty harmony for negroes who are not expected to be musicians and they dance in the style of negroes the captain major then ordered the trumpets to be sounded and we in the boats danced and the captain major did so likewise when he rejoined us the festivity ended we landed where we had landed before and brought a black ox for three bracelets this ox was dined off on sunday we found him very fat and his meat was toothsome as the beef of portugal on sunday many visitors came and brought with them their women and little boys the women remaining at the top of the hill near the sea they had with them many oxen and cows having collected in two spots on the beach they played and danced as they had done on saturday it is the custom of this people for the young men to remain in both with their weapons the older men came to converse with us before we carry on i want to show you how far back some of these things go because he's about to talk about two things but let's first talk about the dance he says the dance that is similar for negroes typical for negroes what dance do you think he is talking about there but let's carry it on carrying a short stick in the hand attached to which was a fox tail we've seen that in egypt we've seen it in nubia we've seen it in the berbers we've seen it in everywhere in africa that's a typical thing they do and you can see here even this far south they're carrying it amongst the koi. Now, here's something that's interesting. There's a lot of images that are of sexual nature, of which I will not display them on here because YouTube will punish me for that. But there is a lot of them depicting men with, you know, with the members that I've spoken of. And there are many scenes depicting these people were living in virtual paradise with almost no problems and they weren't even living in caves most of the time they were living in the open because the animals they had already learned their ways and how to tame them we see this in them being able to ride some of the wild animals which you know today we would talk about capturing and riding these animals being something that happened very far away from Africa a lot of people who try to push the narrative of Africa ignore these images because they think maybe they're too old or they don't fit the narrative of a supreme Africa or anything like that. But actually, I find this to be opposite, of course, because these sand people who first lived here, they joined the Bantu people and formed some of the, the Menemotapa empires, the kingdoms of Congo genetically those people are fused and we know this because we can see through dna tests today that they're reflected in the dna but they also ignore this also in a very bad way because these images start the story of the history and when these images start to slow down even if we don't have evidence of a city or anything when these images start to slow down we know that what's happening is something advanced has replaced it. Something bigger has replaced it. And by monitoring them before 
they became what they are, we are able to understand why they became what they are. In Egypt, we find rock painting like anywhere else. In Nubia, we find it. In Mesopotamia, any place you go, Israel, you will find first these images. And so when you do find them, you have to allow yourself to care about the prehistoric of these nations. Like I showed you in the previous ones, cattle in Chad, not a small deal, not a small deal. With completely ignoring rock art, some Africans have made their argument impossible to win because they are they don't have a full stable, they don't have a full understanding of the history. With the cattle being that old, it rules out farming coming from outside of Africa. And cattle being this far down south, it rules out the idea that it came from north. A second thing is, if we look at the elephants, obviously I've showed you in the other video that some of the animals that are based in Africa end up in Yemen and a lot of these animals are in Africa or India and they are not in the Middle East but then we know that Yemen and Saudi Arabia are closer to Africa than they are to India and so it's a much bigger stretch to assume that they came from India the elephants that are found in Saudi Arabia it's a way bigger stretch to assume they came from India That's just deductive logic. That's just simple one-to-one. -one. And so for you and for anybody who is watching, which by the way, like, share, subscribe, all of that, do not ignore the entire history. You will have a broken case. I mean, if you wonder why there's so many other channels that they give you a slightly warped version of this, even though the, the most true case is the most solid case the best case for ancient egyptians being black is the truth even though most historians today have changed their mind on the idea that black people didn't play a pivotal role in egypt and even though most Egypt, uh, historians today have changed their mind on the greening of the sahara and whether the sahara was just some Berber area, even though there's DNA evidence that proves that a lot of the people who are living now in North Africa are from the Middle East, the people who are living there now are from the Middle East, and they've done DNA, and the fact that they keep doing DNA tells you that they're trying to separate the natives from the newcomers even in Egypt and all these places that they, there's a dispute, there's a problem going on but a lot of people don't want to look at it. They don't want to investigate those things because they're so old that they think, no, I need temples, giant buildings, glass, all this stuff, which is shiny. But to be honest, when you want the truth about Egypt, you're going to have to look at stuff that's not that fascinating. You're going to have to look at normal people. That's why I remember I showed that image of Egypt where there was just a bunch of people getting their hair done. And then I showed another image of like a poor guy with his hair all frizzled up just to show you like we're not I'm not doing what they're doing where they just focus on the most brilliant stuff well kept and it could be altered and of course you know if you're talking about nobles you're talking about a very small population most people of course engaged in some version of art because that's what people do but to have them be depicted in their poverty and in their wealth and they still represent these groups that's not something that we should downplay also keep in mind there's a difference between tribal people today and tribal people back in the day today we look at tribal people like they're poor right like they don't have money or anything like that but remember back then there was no money Back then, they were actually extremely rich compared to today because today they have limited resources. Back in the day, they could do whatever. And of course, if you lived past a certain age, we, we, we know that medicine wasn't that good. Really, it wasn't good until the 1800s. But 
we know that people were falling off as a people but if you live past a certain age you would do you lived in paradise the world as we know it is not to be underestimated and africa as we know it is not to be underestimated so i want to go back i remember now i wanted to go back to the thing i was saying about japan china india madagascar indonesia polynesians and all these other places and the africans that would then end up in those locations i wanted to specify that we know for a fact that africans traveled those places do not ignore that history but at the same time do not overplay that history because it ruins credibility and the last thing you want is to have people think this is just a place i go to see fun stuff but it's not real for example the whole alien thing everybody knows that's not real about the egyptians but every now and then you'll check it out just for fun this is not that a lot of the things that i'm showing you as i always show you evidence a lot of the stuff i'm showing you is nothing but real and a lot of it is mainstream a lot of people think that it's not mainstream but you know there's a difference between the mainstream media and mainstream historians and the historians are still fighting these things every single day <laughs> to make it even funnier is i don't believe cleopatra was black right i don't believe she was part black or anything like that but i saw a historian talking about it the guy who flint dibble the same guy who was on joe rogan's podcast saying that um uh that other guy graham hancock was wrong about everything he said on another podcast that we don't know if cleopatra wasn't part black there's some evidence that shows that it she might have been and again i disagree with him but that's fine i'm, t I'm showing you what mainstream historians think and they talked about Hannibal and they talked about all these other guys and they said we don't know but they could be because their stories about them being of a certain thing and there's you know we haven't done DNA tests of them yet and until we do that we can't really know and remember some things and I showed you this about Egypt a long time ago but I don't know if people remember sometimes people stereotype so there might be someone who's a foreign descent in a certain location but if the art style is typical of one way so in other words if it's renaissance art they might lighten the guy even if the person's really dark skin and so even if someone is really looks a certain way or looks different or looks whatever in ancient egypt they might be you know an arab or they might be black or it might be anything you might depict them in a way that is typical rather than specific to that specific person And of course, there's still the question of what exactly are the Greeks genetically. There's also the problem of why do you separate black and white at some points and not some points? Oh yeah, let's do a final point. Let's do one final point. I know I'm rambling for a while, but this is the important part. Do not allow people, do not allow people to play the one drop rule in the opposite way where they say if you have one drop of anything outside of sub-Saharan Africa then you are not African do not allow that to happen I've, I've talked about it in culture I've talked about it in anything else so and I, I know some people agree with me now right because I've seen some stuff out there that shows this but do not allow them to do it with the genetics where if we find that some people like Tutankhamun are partially by the way the Tutankhamun DNA is not complete so we don't know what else he has inside him but if we find something like Tutankhamun and it's partially Middle Eastern don't let them win by just denying the DNA when you know damn well that them having part Middle Eastern doesn't mean they're not black in fact we know they would be treated as black people today if Tutankhamun looked the way he did back then, or it's any if it's if his image is accurate at all, we know he would have been treated like a black person.